good evening everybody and thank you Mary truly appreciate it as Mary mentioned my name is Chad Stemke uh, I grew up in Detroit Michigan spent most of my life there uh, I now live and reside in Traverse City Michigan and I'm really excited to be here tonight and the name of my talk is the emergence of the gates urban portals and gateways in our cities and what I want to discuss tonight is the fact that over the last several decades art and architecture has emerged in the hearts of some of our major cities that contains an amazing amount of gateway, stargate, ancient Egyptian, and astrological symbolism. These monuments and these parks, they've been hidden in plain sight and they're just waiting to be recognized and utilized by those of us here that can become aware of them. Now these urban portals, as I like to refer to them, many times have emerged on pieces of sacred landscapes. Landscapes that have been imbued with energies sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. And this is much akin to ancient times. Stone monuments and the Giza pyramids, what have you, would be built on pieces of sacred landscape. Well this is perceivably what's taking place with some of these parks and monuments. But now the sacred landscape in North America is many times located in the hearts of some of our major cities. Now, not only are these being built on sacred landscapes, but many times they're also being orientated and correlated to the stars. And sometimes this is surely done intentionally and consciously by the artists and architects. But in some cases, what I've recognized, this may have been done unconsciously. Some of these parks even divinely arranged and surely some may consider this a coincidence maybe even a synchronicity that these incredible monuments containing this gateway and stargate symbolism they're showing up on pieces of sacred landscape sometimes being orientated and correlated to the stars and the heavens but what I propose and want to show today is when we have coincidence after coincidence and synchronicity after synchronicity at some point these may become messages for us. And by us, I mean those of us who can, one, recognize the symbolism and tune into the symbolism, I believe will be afforded the opportunity to actually utilize these monuments. And we'll talk a little bit how we can utilize these monuments as we go on today. Now, in regards to the symbol of the gateway, symbolically speaking, gateways can represent a sense of passing from one state to another one world to another, even the known to the unknown. But the gates can also take on a psychological and dynamic quality that not only indicates a threshold, but invites us to cross that threshold. And that's what we're going to do today is cross that threshold by uncovering and unveiling some of this gateway and stargate symbolism. Now I mentioned we're looking for some stargate symbolism. So I want to clarify the kind of Stargate we're actually looking at tonight. Now, initially, when most of us hear the word Stargate, surely we're thinking of these ring-like objects we've seen in the science fiction movies and the science fiction depictions where you have this ring-like object and people, what have you, can go through this object and travel in intergalactic space at less than the speed of light. Well, that's really cool. I mean, who out here don't want to be able to do that? But it's a little different than the kind of stargate and gateway symbolism we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about a stargate that has best been described by friend and colleague William Henry as a place on Earth that's a shamanic trance portal to other worlds where energy ringing and pulsing from our star, other stars, and star systems is easily received and I believe transmitted. And that's what I believe many of these Stargate parks we're going to look at today are. They're parks located on sacred pieces of landscape where we can go down there and connect with cosmic and stellar energies. So we're going to start off today in my hometown of Detroit, Michigan. In the heart of downtown Detroit, it's a brand, not brand new, it's 30 years old now, but amazing plaza by the name of Heart Plaza. And there is Stargate and Gateway and ancient Egyptian symbolism everywhere down here, leading to the, I like to refer to it now as Stargate Detroit. 
And I just want to go over just a really brief history. I'm going to get a lot more into this tomorrow in my talk. But just briefly, this is Antoine Cadillac, and this is the founder of Detroit. In 1701, Antoine Cadillac was coming up the Detroit River, and he picked what he believed to be the perfect location for Detroit. He pulled his canoe ashore, and he planted his flag, and it happened to be the precise area that Hart Plaza is now located. Now, when Cadillac was coming up the shoreline back in 1701, there used to be ancient stone monuments, ancient mounds, burial mounds, temple mounds. This was already considered hallowed ground to the local Native American Indians. Now, inside of some of these mounds, so what's really amazing, there were thousands, upwards of 10,000 of these relics discovered. These are known as the Michigan relics. Very few people know about this, reason being, Archaeologists say they were a hoax. And I'm going to get into a lot of detail about these tomorrow. But one little thing I'd like to point out is the theology incorporated on them. It's not Native American. That was a main issue with the archaeologists. Obviously, these must be hoax. We'll get into this tomorrow a little bit in my talk. But the point I'm making is that this has always been a sacred landscape for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. So moving up the timeline a little bit to the year 1947. This is Eero Saarinen, architect from the Detroit area. Detroit was upgrading the riverfront, hired Eero Saarinen, and he felt that a civic center, the base of Woodward and Jefferson, just seemed right, just seemed like it fit in. The same year, Eero Saarinen was imagining another monument, the Gateway Arch. Getting back to Detroit, 30 years later, another artist by the name of Osama Noguchi comes to town and implements Eero Saarinen's plans, brings Hart Plaza into fruition. And wait till you see some of the symbolism Mr. Noguchi incorporated down here. Now the first thing I want to point out is the layout, the general layout of Hart Plaza. What Noguchi did is he orientated and correlated Hart Plaza to the Giza pyramids. And I'd like to point out the several monuments, the amphitheater, this is the Horus and Sun Fountain. And this is actually a pyramid aligned precisely with the Giza pyramids. In Giza, there's a causeway that leads to the Sphinx. Here in Hart Plaza, there's a causeway that leads from the Horus and Sun Fountain to a pylon. Looks like a large Egyptian-styled obelisk. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through these several monuments and just Look if we see any correlations, synchronicities, coincidence, where we can try and make a legitimate comparison. So we'll start off with the amphitheater, then we'll look at the Horus and Sun Fountain, the pyramid, then we'll take the causeway to the pylon. And what we know about amphitheaters, all amphitheaters, is that they are transmitters and receivers of frequency and vibration, tunes and tones. And as we go through these parks tonight, you'll see that these amphitheaters are instrumental in these Stargate parks. They're a place where you can go and soak up the vibrations. And here in Hart Plaza in particular, this whole bowl of an amphitheater is done in red granite. And of course, granite is filled with quartz crystal, the perfect transmitter and receiver of frequency and vibration, tunes and tones. Moving on to the, in the heart of Detroit, in the heart of Hart Plaza, is the Horus and Sun fountain. This was also done by artist Osama Noguchi, the same gentleman who did the general layout of the plaza. Now, according to Mr. Noguchi, the Horus and Sun fountain here, in his own words, is symbolic of our relationship to outer space. And there's incredible symbolism surrounding this fountain. And you can see what he's saying. That our relationship to outer space at night and the lights are flashing around this thing kind of resembles a UFO. I can kind of see what he's saying. Now it's actually dedicated, like I mentioned, to Horace, and this is Horace Dodge, Dodge Automobile Pioneer. We're down here in Detroit, Michigan. Well, I think we can look at the name Horace as synchronistic. We're looking for Egyptian symbolism. But this is actually dedicated to Horace and Son, as I mentioned. Well, it just so happens Horace named his son Horace Jr. And in Egyptian mythology, in some cases, there's a Horace the Elder and a Horace the Son. So I'm thinking in quite a literal sense, we can look at this fountain here as dedicated to Horus the Elder and Horus the Sun. It just so happens, coincidentally, Horus the Elder here, he was born in Niles, Michigan, kind of like the Nile River. 
And we're just scratching the surface on the symbolism of that fountain. I'm going to get into a lot more detail about that in my talk tomorrow if anyone's interested. And to correlate the final pyramid in Giza, here in Hart Plaza, in the exact same position, we have a pyramid. Now, we've got to look too far for symbolism. It's actual pyramid. There's signs pointing away. Of course, in ancient Egypt, pyramids were considered gateways to the stars. I think we can consider a gateway to the stars a stargate. Now, leading from the Horus and Sun Fountain, the causeway leads to the pylon at the entrance to Hart Plaza. And we, we could assign all kinds of symbolism to this pylon here. So it's right at the entrance of Hart Plaza. I mean, surely it's a transmitter and receiver of sorts. But I like to give you the author's own words and the artist as much as I can. Rather than speculate, let's tell you what the artist says. And the artist says the pylon here, it was done by nature originally. You might call it wind. It relates to the atmosphere, to space flight, and all aspirations that we have today. So in Osama Noguchi's own words, he's saying the pylon here is symbolic of space flight, all our aspirations. And its companion piece, the Horus and Sun Fountain, this is symbolic of our relationship to outer space. This is in the artist's own words down here. Has anybody heard this before? Now, Osama Noguchi, did he build this plaza intentionally? Did he align it to the Giza Plateau intentionally or maybe a little unconsciously? In regards to intentionally, before he came down here to Detroit, he was on a two-year sojourn around the world where he spent most of his time at the temples in India, but the majority at the Great Pyramids in Giza. He was really interested in the relationship the Egyptians had with their sacred sites as well as the heavens and the stars. And he comes back to Detroit and he gets his very first opportunity to create a civic center on his own. And this is what he comes up with, Stargate Detroit. Now as far as unconsciously, I'll get into that a little bit tomorrow with some of his previous artworks. I believe a lot of this was done unconsciously, almost as if some of the symbolism was downloaded through Noguchi into his blueprints. I'll get into that a little more in detail tomorrow. But in short, I think Osama Noguchi, he was in contact with cosmic consciousness. And he came down here to Hart Plaza, or came down to Detroit, I'm sorry, and created Hart Plaza as, I believe, a cosmic temple. A place where we can all go and connect with these same stellar energies that Osama Noguchi once connected with. All Heart Plaza, the part we looked at so far, was done in the mid-1970s. And we haven't even got to any of the gateway and stargate symbolism yet. In 2001, Detroit held its tricentennial celebrations, its 300th birthday. I call this the emergence of the gates. This is when a lot of the gateway symbolism came into play down here in downtown Detroit. First gift Detroit received is this brand new park, Tricentennial Park. The names of the blueprint was the gateway vision. Then back at Hart Plaza, they received this brand new monument. The area that Hart Plaza occupies was once one of the last stops on the Underground Railroad. This was known as the Gateway to Freedom. Here you can see the conductor of the Underground Railroad pointing the slaves to freedom across the Detroit River. And part way between the Gateway to Freedom and the Horace and Sun Fountain was this monument. I didn't know what to make of this at first, really. It was down there with my friend William Henry, and he pointed out to me, you know, kind of looks like the Tower of Babel. Even look around the top here. you got all these cameras. We look at those as, symbolically speaking, the watchers. You know, why not? Why not? And, of course, we can refer to the Tower of Babel as the gateway to the gods. We already looked at the Horse and Sun Fountain, but they rededicated it for Detroit's 300th birthday, gave it a brand new plaque, and now the plaque reads, this is an engine of water at the gateway to a great city, referring to Hart Plaza once again as a gateway. And this is the real gateway. This is the focal point of Hart Plaza right here, the transcending gateway. Many of these monuments will be named in the recognition of transformation. It's very important just to look at the names of some of these monuments. It's a pretty much dead giveaway. And this is a 63 foot tall monument and according to David Barr, who is the artist, he says this is symbolic of a gear protruding from the earth. This is actually 
uh, UAW monument, United Auto Workers. And he says the opening at the top, that's symbolic of the work or the labor that is yet to be done. And I think when we hear the word labor, we can think of a birthing process, maybe even a rebirthing process. Now, I see what David Barr is saying. It's a UAW monument. Kind of looks like a gear. When I'm looking at this thing, to me, it looks like a Stargate. And local Detroiters, you know, everybody says, meet me down at the Stargate monument. That's just what everybody calls it. So I actually wrote Mr. Barr and asked him. It's like, I know it's, you th say this is symbolic of a gear, but did a Stargate ever, you, you know, cross your mind while you were designing the transcending monument? David Barr actually wrote me back. I didn't expect him to. He wrote me back. said, sorry, Chad. Stargate never crossed my mind. But that being said, the green granite spiral, there's a green granite spiral that leads around and through the center of the gateway. He says the green granite spiral, that allows the visitor, the spectator, to leave the grid of the city for the sphere of space. So I'm like, wow, to me, David Barr just unconsciously described a Stargate. How, you know, how better do you describe an urban portal than to allow the spectator to leave the grid of the city for the sphere of space? So that's all in a small little nine acre area known as Hart Plaza in the heart of downtown Detroit. And surely you can work on your heart shocker down here, there's no doubt about it. And tomorrow, just three blocks north of here is its sister complex, Campus Mars. And wait till you see what's at Campus Mars. And I'll get into that tomorrow, but Stargate Detroit, this is, I believe it's a cosmic temple. And when you go down here and you start seeing these monuments and you read the signs and you start seeing the monuments and the park from a new perspective or from a new light, that is a large personal transformation. And when you start to follow the path or the Stargate Trail following these clues, these synchronicities, these coincidences, even archetypes, it gives you a sense of relationship to the cosmic flows of the universe. And that, in general, is the power of Stargate Detroit. It's a place we can go and connect with stellar energies. Now what I'd like to do, I, I just skimmed through Detroit. I'm going to really get into detail about it tomorrow. But I'd like to go through the Midwest a little bit and show you a few other cities and how this symbolism is showing up everywhere. So we'll move over to the Windy City, Chicago. Not too far from here, I think. I, we can't all go to, say, the Giza Pyramids or these incredible sacred sites around the world every year, but I think if we want, we can make a trip to Detroit or to Chicago. And realistically, I think we can connect with the same energies. So this is the park we're going to look at in Chicago. Brand new park called Millennium Park. Built in 2004. It's the largest rooftop garden in the world. And the first thing I'd like to point out in Millennium Park, by taking the bird's eye perspective of looking down at it, you have this incredible serpent bridge. Then you have these green and growing gardens, which I speculate, could these be symbolic of the chakra system considering we have the serpent bridge? Could we look at this as the Kundalini bridge or the life force energy bridge? But if it is, why is it not coiling up the chakra system? Where is it trying to lead? So we're going to follow the serpent bridge or the Kundalini bridge and see where it's taking us. And it was actually, this was done by an artist by the name of Frank Gehry. And what I'd like to point out about the serpent bridge is you have the serpent and the cosmic egg. Rather common symbolism. In Peebles, Ohio, at the serpent mound, you got the serpent and the cosmic egg. Many different crop circles have had the same symbolism, and I think we can consider this the serpent and the cosmic egg also. And what we know about bridges in particular, bridges separate separate realms. And in this particular case, the serpent bridge separates the realms of the green and growing gardens to the east to the realm of the gates to the west. Yeah, this is J. Pritzker Pavilion, most intricate outdoor amphitheater in North America. You have these speakers on the trellis system and the tunes and the tones, the frequency and the vibrations literally surround you. And I like to get other people's opinions on these monuments sometimes, so I came across this from Ann Raver, the New York Times. According to Ann Raver, when she saw the Pritzker Pavilion for the first time, she thought its maw of curling steel looked like a celestial gateway 
to another universe. I can kind of see what she's saying. These are the urban activators. And there was two of them there. I say there was because these were temporary exhibits. Every year Millennium Park has new exhibits. This was last year's. The urban activators, and they are what they say they are. They were meant to energetically activate the viewer and the spectator. And at night, just as many of these other monuments, they changed the colors of the rainbow. Right next to the urban activators was the crown fountain. You had these two giant fountains that project the faces of local Chicago citizens, and from their mouth they blast out the jet of life. And what happened to me when I was here is I went out in the middle of this reflection pool with all these children to get these photos, and quite unexpectedly, you know, I had to take my shoes off, and it, it was almost as if you could soak up the energy of these children through your feet. By the time I, I was probably in here three minutes, and the time I walked out, I felt like I was a five-year-old. It was not what I was expecting. But I think if there's anywhere at Millennium Park to go to open and lighten your heart, it's most likely right here at the Crown Fountain. And at night, it changes the colors of the rainbow, as many of these monuments and many of these other parks do after dark. When we see all these monuments changing the colors of the rainbow, we can contemplate the Rainbow Bridge, a communications link between the humanity and the gods, the earthly realms, the heavenly realms, and even ourselves and our higher selves. I believe that's what this Rainbow Bridge symbolism is pointing to. And the focal point, the focal point of Millennium Park, Cloud Gate. Each one of these parks will have a focal point named in the recognition of transformation. Detroit, it was transcending. Here it's Cloud Gate. This was done by a British artist by the name of Anish Kapoor. According to Mr. Kapoor, he says that this was symbolic of a liquid drop of mercury. And alchemists were convinced that mercury transcended both the solids, the liquid states, both earth and heaven, life and death. And, of course, one of the symbols for mercury is the serpent. Now what he wanted to do with this, in his own words, is he wanted to create a sculpture that would manipulate the viewer's relationship with time and space. And he did an amazing job of it. Because when you look at this monument, what it does, is not only does it distort the surrounding skyline, but it actually slows down the people and the clouds passing by it. So in a very literal sense, when you're looking at the outside of Cloud Gate, it does distort your time and space. And that's why you're just looking at the outside of it. Not only does Cloud Gate reflect the outside world, but it seems to dematerialize the world when you walk underneath of it. You walk underneath and you look up, and I call this the Cloud Gate Portal. You literally watch yourself transcend through this portal here. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Here you can, here I am taking a picture, and if you look close, you can see it, see me just, you know, going through this portal. And when you're having this experience in real time, it's, it's amazing. And according to Anish Kapoor, Cloud Gate should survive for at least another thousand years. And I'm, I'm thinking Cloud Gate is most likely creating a ceremonial and sacred space right underneath it, right where it sits. A million people a year go and visit Cloud Gate. Imagine if just a portion of them could recognize the symbolism and have a transformational experience. The effect that this one monument for a thousand years, when a million people a year, what kind of effect could this have on society? And this is just one monument in one part. You know, we got to include all these parks and all these monuments. So we're just going to sum it up right there with Chicago. And we're not get, getting a chance today to see some of the symbolism that radiates out from these parks. Today we're just focusing on the parks. But there's incredible symbolism that radiates out from these parks also. But we crossed the Serpent Bridge, checked out the Pritchard Pavilion, the Celestial Gateway, lightened your heart at Crown Fountain, get activated energetically at the Urban Activators, and go through the Cloud Gate Portal. All in a day of fun at Millennium Park. Sticking to the Midwest, we're going to go to St. Louis. And I think most of us know the icon of St. Louis, the Gateway Arch. Of course, the Gateway Arch. 
And with many of these cities, St. Louis is located on a piece of sacred landscape, City of the Sun, better known to most of us as Cahokia Mounds. And I just want to point out this one mound. This is Monk's Mound. It's the largest mound there. Here's a scale size of Monk's Mound next to the Great Pyramid. This is enormous, enormous. The base is larger, and if the sides would have continued up, this mound, it's just a mound of earth, would have been larger than the Great Pyramid. It's the largest earthen structure in the Western Hemisphere. And it's same same trend as Detroit and some of these other cities, lots of ancient relics discovered in these mounds. We're not going to get into it tonight, but a lot of these ancient relics correlate too. You find a lot of the same theology on these relics. But what comes into fruition is the icon of St. Louis, the Gateway Arch. This was done by, as I mentioned, Eero Saarinen, the same guy who envisioned Hart Plaza back in Detroit. 630 feet tall, 630 feet wide. This is our nation's tallest national monument. And according to Eero Saarinen, he said the major concern was to create a monument which would have a lasting significance and would be a landmark of our time. Neither an obelisk, a rectangular box, nor a dome seemed right on this site for this purpose. But right here, the edge of the Mississippi River, a great arch did seem right. Just seemed to fit in. And when you compare some of these cities, you start to come up with a lot of coincidences. Maybe synchronicities. Call it what you want. But I just want to go over a few of them. Of course, in Stargate, Detroit, 1947, Errol Sirenin imagined Hart Plaza. 1947, he also imagined the Gateway Arch. Hart Plaza is located off Jefferson Avenue. Gateway Arch, the Jefferson National Expansion. I mean, even little things like the area code. Detroit's 313. St. Louis is 314. They're both off freshwater rivers. Detroit and the Mississippi. They're both off sacred landscapes. Both had ancient relics discovered in the same vicinity. They're both made out of stainless steel. Transcending is 63 feet and the gateway arch is 630 feet. A lot of similarities. None of these artists didn't know each other. It's like the symbolism was just supposed to be or meant to be in these cities. And although Saarinen built this to be symbolic of an arch, he wanted it to be symbolic of an obelisk when you viewed it from the side. So in this one monument, he incorporated both the male and the female symbolism, the womb and the phallic symbol. Now, personally, the first time I drove into town to go check this out, I seen this thing glistening in the city lights, glistening like the rainbow. First thing that came to my head, and I mean, I got rainbows on my head at this point because I'm doing research, but it was the Rainbow Bridge. And of course, like I mentioned, the Rainbow Bridge can be considered a communications link between humanity and the gods earthly realms and the heavenly realms and ourselves and our higher selves. But just because this thing glistens in the colors of the rainbow, I didn't feel that was quite enough, you know, to come up here and actually talk about it. So I went inside. You can actually take a tram ride to the top of the gateway arch. So I decided I'd go there and take the tram ride and just, you know, see what I saw. And, whoops, sorry. And the first thing you see when you go into the underworld or the basement of the Gateway Arch to take the tram ride, this giant mural, 45 feet long, 15 foot tall brick mural. And this is dedicated to all the artists and all the architects who built our nation's national monuments. And what you see is, of course, the obelisk, Mount Rushmore, the Gateway Arch, Statue of Liberty. Does anybody recognize any monument in this picture that wasn't built? by one of these gentlemen up here. The Rainbow Bridge. Utah's Rainbow Bridge sits right behind Lady Liberty. And of course, the Statue of Liberty, she's officially titled Liberty Enlightening the World. Utah's Rainbow Bridge is described as the, as the world's largest natural bridge. And when I seen this, to me, this depiction is highly similar. I mean, highly similar to ancient Christian art with Jesus sitting on the Rainbow Bridge. Or in our Capitol Dome of the United States, William Henry has pointed out that George Washington, he hovers on the Rainbow Bridge just like Jesus. But, I, you know, I didn't recall seeing Liberty on the Rainbow Bridge. So I actually Googled Liberty and Rainbow Bridge to see what pop up. 
And, well, she pops up in front of this bridge down here in Japan. I'm like, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. Very similar depiction, but not quite what I was looking for, or so I thought. Come to find out, that's actually the Rainbow Bridge. That's what it's called. That's Tokyo's Rainbow Bridge, and there, Lady Liberty is enlightening the world in front of these rainbow bridges all over the world. St. Louis, D.C., Tokyo, and there's other examples out there. Then I recalled, there she is. I had seen her on the bridge before. She's right next to the father of our country, George. Liberty riding a rainbow bridge, holding her book of secrets and her labyrinth axe. So, you know, at that point I'm thinking, there's some rainbow bridge symbolism here in the Gateway Arch. <laughs> to me, you know, no question about it. So there's one last monument before you actually got on the tram ride, and it's this Mark Twain exhibit, this Prohibition exhibit, and you have these children, what they do while they're waiting to get on the tram ride is they weigh themselves. And whoever was lighter thought they got to get on the tram ride first, which kind of surprised me. When I'm a kid, I'm thinking, whoever's the tallest or whoever's the heaviest, you're growing up. Whoever was lighter, I watched three sets of kids do this, thought they got to get on the tram ride first, which brought to my mind the Judgment Day ceremony of the ancient Egyptian weighing of the heart, where they'd weigh the heart against the feathers of Mott, if the heart weighed less than the feather, you were permitted access to cross the rainbow bridge to the dimension of the blessed. To me, very similar scenario. So when the door opens, the tram car, imagine the surprise when you realize the actual door that takes you to the top, it's a sun with a door that you get in. When you think of a sun door, can't we think of a star gate, at least symbolically? Next stop, top of the rainbow bridge, or the gateway arch. You get to the top of the gateway arch, and this is your view. Here's Jefferson National Expansion, the old courthouse, and we're going to look at some of the symbolism and the sculptures down here in just a few minutes. I'm not trying to compare myself to Jesus or George Washington by any means up here, but what I'm saying is if we can recognize this rainbow bridge symbolism, I think we can use monuments such as these as catalyst for working on and activating our own personal rainbow bridges, our chakra system. Here's an ancient depiction of this. Queen Elizabeth raising the rainbow bridge. And I believe for the most part this is the same depiction, only more modern, of raising our inner rainbow bridge. So when we see depictions like these, well we got these fully activated, transformed figures sitting in front of these rainbow-like concentric rings. What I'm thinking we're looking at, I'm thinking we're looking up into the end of the rainbow, so to speak. And these are your pots of gold, alchemically speaking, at the end of the rainbow. And I think this is something we can all do and all work on. These are the pots of gold at the end of the rainbow. So when we see this art, this architecture, that has the symbols of the rainbow rings, or even the gateway arch, I think we can use these as catalysts. Catalysts in the process of, one, sparking our imagination, two, opening and enlightening our hearts, and I think, most importantly, activating our rainbow bridges, our chakra systems. Now, we're, we're still in the gateway arch. We're back in the basement now. I mean, this is pretty amazing. This is like looking at the transcending monument in Detroit, but you can actually go inside of this thing and walk around, go to the top. I mean, there's not too many monuments in the world where you can do this. And you go down to the basement, and the centerpiece of the basement is a sculpture of Thomas Jefferson. This is Jefferson National Expansion, of course. And he's standing on the dot, surrounded by concentric rings. Well, rather than speculate what this means, I'll tell you what the artist said. He says, Thomas Jefferson, standing down here in this dot surrounded by concentric rings, is symbolic of a space-time continuum. So visitors can get an appropriate three-dimensional visitor experience. So in the underworld of the basement of the Rainbow Bridge or the Gateway Arch, we have Thomas Jefferson standing in the artist's own words in a space-time continuum, a stargate.
So now we're going to look. We're going to leave the gateway arch. But so far, we've just been inside this one incredible monument. We're going to look at the Gateway Mall. And we're just going to have to skim through this for due to time, but there's got to be good 30 to 40 incredible sculptures lining the way through this Gateway Mall. I mean, just amazing symbolism this whole way. So I believe it's like four blocks of just nothing but sculptures and beautiful stuff. The first sculpture I'd like to look at, this is a sculpture of Eros, the Greek god. And this is supposed to be symbolic of a relic of the Greek god discovered. And Eros is one of those gods, like many others, that has taken over many personifications over the years. And originally, he took on, originally he was hatched from the cosmic egg, along with Gaia. This is a beautiful painting by my friend Patty Lou back here. And Eros also took on the personification of Cupid. That's the one, you know, most people are familiar with is Cupid, the god of love and desire. And I love this painting. You got Eros going through this, like, vibratory wormhole, and you have these two eyes or irises staring back at you. I didn't know what to make of those irises at first. So I did a little digging and come to find out in a less known personification of Eros, his mother was actually Iris, the rainbow goddess. In Greek mythology, Iris took on the personification of the rainbow. She was a messenger goddess, and she was the goddess of the rainbow bridge. And of course, our Iris of our eyes are named after Iris, the rainbow goddess. And the reason I point this out is because what happens when you go down here to City Garden and Gateway Mall, you have the opportunity to become the Irises of Eros. And you climb into Eros' head, you become the iris, and you look out, and guess what you look at? You look back at the throne of Iris, the rainbow goddess. And recall who this was designed and created by? Eros Serenin. Eros Serenin. And do I think this symbolism right here was intentional? No, I don't. I think this was unconscious. I think these monuments are just being placed where they're supposed to be at the right time. And some of the symbolism is working its way unconsciously into the blueprints of these artists and these architects. Now, recall he was, uh, Eros originally was hatched from the cosmic egg in one personification, which will bring us to our next sculpture, the door of return. And giant cosmic egg up top. And once again, I'm going to tell you, the artist says, and what comes right out of this is the city garden brochure. You know, I'm not making this stuff up. The egg-shaped form at the top of the door resembles a seed that has just split open or a mouth that opens to the sky like a baby's first cry. Artist Ken Yasuda has left the answer deliberately ambiguous, leading us to think about time and space, life and death, the past and the present, and when we pass through the door, what is the place we are returning to? The Door of Return, another one of these monuments named the Recognition of Transformation. And right next, oh, well, I like to call this the Door of Return action. You see this little boy here seems to be in a state of pure wonder, almost, you know, almost as if he recognizes that seed up there, or recognizes this door. And right next to the door returns another monument. It's entitled the Two White Rabbits. And you have these two white rabbits. They're sitting on their rabbit holes. And when I see these giant white rabbits sitting on their rabbit holes, what comes to my mind is, well, Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole. Or even what the bleep do we know? Down the rabbit hole, drawing a wormhole into our consciousness. Not too long ago, the movie The Last Mimsy, a scientist sends back a white rabbit through a stargate to the past. More recently, the movie Knowing, before these children depart with these two light beings, they carry their two white rabbits. So when I see the white rabbits down at City Garden, Gateway Mall, I'm thinking rabbit holes and wormhole symbolism. And we're going to sum up Stargate St. Louis like that. We looked at the Rainbow Bridge, Gateway Arch, of course, Liberty in front of it, the Door of Return, the White Rabbits and the Rabbit Holes, and we didn't get to zine it today, but, you know, another credible monument. So what I think is happening is 
I think humanity, we're being downloaded with the Stargate wormhole gateway symbolism, and we're being done so through mass media and many other ways, but most importantly and most prominently, I believe, through this art and through this architecture. It's showing up, and it's only starting to be recognized right now as if the time is right, and that time is now, I believe. So I'm going to show you a few other cities just really briefly. I'm going to skim through them, but just kind of make a point how this is taking place all over North America. Actually, the world for that case, but all over North America. So this is Bicentennial Mall in Nashville. This is kind of where it all started with William Henry, discovering some of the incredible symbolism incorporated in this mall. And he says this is, this is a 2,200-foot antenna. This park is a literal transmitter and receiver. And as with many of these other parks, it's built upon a sacred landscape. Capitol building actually sits on top of an ancient mound. More relics discovered. And William points out the blueprint, the Bicentennial Mall, highly resembles the ancient blueprint of Mount Meru. Meru was considered the seat of cosmic powers, the axis that connected the Earth with the universe, the super antenna of the inflow and the outflow of spiritual energies on our planet. And this is a place where you can go and connect with these energies. Not only that, but he points out that in Robert Flood's drawing of the perfected man, it indicates that the mall symbolizes higher consciousness. See the cord of three such stars and the triceps symbolizing higher consciousness there? Look at a few of the monuments. This is the black sun, a beacon of the Mount Meru pillar, and you know, enough said, kind of looks like a stargate. The court of three stars. You have this giant court surrounded by 50 pillars. And these pillars all have bells in them and they ring and vibrate every so often. And they encapsulate the red, white, and blue granite court of three stars. Like I mentioned, granite is a filled with quartz crystal. Perfect transmitter and receiver. This is a place you can, just like Detroit, just like Chicago, St. Louis, that you can go and connect with these cosmic and these stellar energies. Dallas. Who thought there could be a Stargate Park in Dallas? Well, there is. This is called Thanksgiving Square. And you have the Spiral Tower, or the Thanks Thanksgiving Chapel. Once again, highly resembles the Tower of Babel, the gateway to the gods. Then you go inside the spiral tower and you look up and you look up into the glory window. And this window symbolizes the blessing of the divine descending to the earth as well as the ascent of human praise to the gratitude of God. And you go outside and here's your focal point. It's called the ring of thanks, the circle of giving. And it's a stargate symbol. 23 karat, karat gold leaf. It's 14 feet wide. Has seven white granite stepping stones that serve as a walkway through the ring, which is mounted within a gray granite circle of giving. Notice there's a lot of granite, a lot of quartz going on around these monuments. And what I'd like to point out, this is in Dallas, Ring of Thanks, Detroit Transcending. Built 10 years apart, these artists did not know each other, but the symbolism incorporated is identical. And these are the plaques that come along with them on the walls. And as you can see here, it says right down here, you circle into the ring of thanksgiving. And over here in Detroit, you do the same thing. You spiral around the, the green granite spiral that allows you to leave the grid of the city for the sphere of space. Absolutely identical symbolism showing up in different cities. Artists had no clue about each other. Stargate, Colorado. Of all places, Colorado, the Garden of the Gods. Once again, a sacred landscape. And there's actually a Tower of ba Babel rock. There's a Gateway rock. But what kind of park is going to emerge near the Garden of the Gods? Well, this is called America the Beautiful. Another brand new park. The name of that fountain back there, this is the Continuum Fountain. 
And if anyone knows anything about the science fiction Stargate, there's the Stargate Continuum, and the original series took place at Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, which is right there. Fiction, non-fiction. Like, this is a Stargate video game. I mean, this is starting to become a reach, but it works. You got the obelisk and the Stargate. And then you come back to Colorado and you got the obelisk and the Stargate. Fiction, non-fiction. Fiction, non-fiction. Now, I mentioned in my intro that these things are hidden in plain sight, just waiting to be recognized. It's waiting to be utilized. But they're in plain sight, all right. All you got to do is go to these parks and look look at the names. Look what's written on the wall in stone, literally. More times than not, the focal points of these plazas will be named in the recognition of transformation. So I just want to go through a few of these monuments to prove my point. Of course, in Detroit, we had the Transcending Monument. In Warren, done by the same artist, this is dawn, dawning of a new day. We looked at the Gateway to Freedom. We didn't get to it today. This is in Birmingham, this rainbow ring, the journey home. Cloud Gate, the urban activators. The Gateway Arch and the door of return. The Ring of Thanks and of course the Continuum Fountain. So the symbolism is showing up everywhere. Dawn, Continuum, Transcending, Ring of Thanks, the Journey Home. Here's some rainbow rings. These are actually in Grand Rapids by the way. But the same symbolism is emerging absolutely everywhere. So what do we make? of the fact that this incredible Stargate, Gateway, Egyptian architecture and symbolism is showing up in our cities just waiting to be recognized, waiting to be utilized. Well, I think when we start seeing these monuments and we start recognizing the symbolism, we'll start seeing not only these monuments, but the parks in a whole new light and a new perspective. And that in turn can help us to see ourselves and the world around us in that new light. And that's a large personal transformation. And when we see the symbol of the ring or even the arch and they've been placed on pieces of sacred landscape, they've been named in the recognition of transformation, can't we start to use them as such? Can't we start to use these as tools? Tools of transformation. Tools we can use to work on our light bodies and our rainbow bodies. Tools we can use to spark our imaginations. Tools we can use to open and lighten our hearts. And I think the answer to that is absolutely. I think we can start right now. So the message I would like everyone to take home. Personally, I believe these the cloud gates, they may be parting. I believe the door of return, it may be slowly cracking open, giving us all glimpses of what's expected of us, preparatory to our journey home. And at, just as Dr. Martin Luther King once proclaimed in his I Have a Dream speech in Detroit, I believe now is the time to begin carving tunnels of hope through the mountains of despair, to start transforming dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. I think this is something each and every one of us can do by one recognizing the symbolism, tuning into it, utilizing it, and beginning to transcend these gateways to freedom. So once again, we can be cosmically speaking free at last. Thank you so much everybody for your attention. I truly appreciate it. <laughs>